All right, hi, I'm Aaron, and I am a data engineer at Spotify. And I'm going to talk to you today about unified pipeline architecture and how we have evolved the data processing at Spotify from the old model to this, what we call unified architecture. So I will actually introduce Spotify in case you're not familiar with it. So this is what Spotify is. It's essentially a music player. You can, uh, there's a, a desktop version, a phone version, and um, anyone can have an account. You can listen. There's a free version, premium version. Might look like this. So however, on Creator, which is the team that I'm on, our main customer is actually not a consumer, but the artist. So we create a platform for artists that we call Spotify for Artists. And what it is, it's essentially a dashboard that allows the artists to uh, see some metrics about how well their music is doing on Spotify. And I'm going to show you a quick demo. So this is Fan Insights. I'm Beatles. So I want to see how many listeners I have. So I can see kind of over time how many listeners I have. Shows you some statistics about the fans as well as what context um, on Spotify people listen from, so like Spotify playlists, et cetera, what the demographics of your listeners are, who else they listen to, so you can think of it as like artists who are similar to you who might want to have in your concert as opener. Um, how they listen across different geographies, so it's kind of color-coded by the number of listeners, as well as top cities. You can then drill down and you can go on the song page, which show you all of your tracks or top 200 tracks that you have on Spotify. And you can see here kind of which, um, you know, by streams and by number of listeners, which ones are the most frequently listened tracks. So for instance, if we want to see how this one is doing, here comes the sun. Um, you can see over the last several time frames how many listeners you have, how many streams, how many saves, and kind of the same information as you saw on the artist page. You can also see which playlists this song is in. So yeah, so that's, that's SFI. So SFI is a very large dashboard, and we try to provide as much analytics for the artists as we can. So it poses a very interesting data problem uh, for, for us. So um, how do we actually build this dashboard? We have, for data, we have one primary source that we derive all the data from. And I'll mention this source a lot, so I wanted to present it. It's called NSONG. So the NSONG is essentially a, a log message. So every time that you finish listening a song for whatever reason, either because the next one started, or because um, the new song starts in the playlist, or because you just skipped, or you know skipped immediately, we'll create a log message called NSONG. It contains certain information about the track, so we kind of know where you were listening it from, so that's play context, as well as the location of the person listening, user ID, and track ID. And from that, we try to derive most useful, for all, most of the information that you saw on the dashboard is actually derived from this. We have a couple of secondary sources, so we can also, you know, you can imagine we probably have some sort of metadata that explains kind of what the track information is, what the user information is, playlist information, et cetera. When we set out building this, we had a system, and actually the system that you saw is powered by the current architecture. Um, the current architecture was built actually about a year ago. So we talk about evolution, it's not that, uh, it's, it's actually very recent. So the way that that was built, as you can think of it as like classic MapReduce, there is, you, you have a data endpoint, which is a set of data, it's a data set, and you have independent code paths that compute intermediary sources for each data set. Um, each endpoint has about three to six intermediate computation stages. Um, and the way that it's designed, it's kind of tailored towards what you're trying to compute. So intermediate data is not very reusable. It has a lot of advantages. It is extremely flexible. 
because every time that you need to build a new pipeline, you just build it from scratch. You compute what you need kind of from the, from the ground truth. And it's the other nice thing is it's adaptable to many changing requirements. So if the requirements change and you need to change one thing, you only have to change it in one pipeline. However, it does have some issues. So the issues you can imagine with such a setup, this end song, for instance, that I referred to, you have to read it very many times because every single uh, path of the execution, you have to read it once to compute everything you need to compute. The multi-layer dependencies cause cascading effects if there are any issues or delays, and I'll go a little bit in depth about what that is, and it can also cause data inconsistencies. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is redundant dependencies. So this is, for, for our pipeline orchestration, we use Luigi. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's an open source project. So this shows you a Luigi execution, a sample Luigi execution. So say we want to compute that endpoint up at the top. In order to compute that, we need to actually compute everything that's in the second row. In order to compute everything in the second row, we need to compute everything in the third row, et cetera. So as you can imagine, if that source right there is delayed, or that endpoint is delayed, it causes the cascading effect. So in this particular case, we're trying to compute one of our definitions of fan is you need to actually look at the listener history for last 182 days. So that's why this has as many sources as it has. Because we are aggregating daily, we're aggregating monthly into weekly, and then we aggregate into monthly. So this is a dashboard that we have internally which shows us um, how our endpoints are doing if they're done computing. So in this case, it's on a good day, 10 a.m. So we operate like our days are end in UTC. So this is 10 a.m. in the US is what, like, I don't know, 2 p.m. UTC or something. Hopefully I'm doing my math right. So um, anything that's green is done. Those are all the endpoints that need to compute every day. Anything that's green is done. Anything that's blue is currently executing. Everything that's gray hasn't even started executing. So you can imagine that if you have such cascading effects, what happens if one of your sources is delayed or one of your computations failed or died for whatever reason, the source up at the top that depends on it will not complete until much later. So that's kind of, so that's a good day. So ideally by 8 a.m. UTC, we want to be done. So realistically, that's not the case. The other thing it can cause is data inconsistency. So in this case, we have an artist who has a, one single track. And this track happens to be on a playlist. So here you can see the playlist information. It shows you the number of listeners that you have overall from all your tracks. And here you have just the list of all the songs. So as you can see, the numbers are very different. And the result, well, there's probably some assumption in one of these pipelines that got propagated. And as a result, we got different results. So that's not ideal. So that's kind of. You know, in the current architecture, that's kind of, you can think of it this way. So you have the end song, which is our source, and from there it computes completely disjointed paths. So when you have something like the playlist example I was just alluding to, you have listener by song might be that red dot right there, and listener by playlist might be over there. And then it gets aggregated further, and that causes this. And overall it looks something like this. So when we set out to rebuild this architecture, which has been a project we've been working on for a while with a team, my team, um, we wanted to see is, can we read each source only once? So if we have a single source, it's kind of redundant to keep reading it many times, especially if it's quite large, which in our case our end song is. How can we reduce the computation time? And in this case, it's not even the actual time that the pipeline takes to run, but can we make it so that more things run in parallel, so that there's fewer things that actually need to run? Can we join all the secondary sources as they come in rather than waiting until the end of the day? So um, can we essentially pre-compute certain things as we know that what they are? And on the flip side, 
um, the big advantage of the old system was that it's very flexible, so we want to be able to retain the flexibility to add new data sets or new fields. So the new architecture, what we call unified architecture, looks kind of like this. And what does this mean? And, and I mean, I'll go in much more depth, but in, uh, from the high level, you have your source, it gets read in once, then you have a bunch of intermediary computation stages that denormalize the data, but then we bring them back together. So essentially any pair of keys or any aggregation, we do only once, and then we bring it back together to actually compute the final results. So we compute everything at the artist level and at the track level, so that's. The, at the high level, and the architect, our new architecture has these components. It has our sources, of course. It has um, what we call entities, and it has data sets, and it has exports. And I will now talk to you a little bit more about what those are. So this is the overall architecture diagram, and as you can see, the, the information flows from top down. So that means there's no kind of dependencies going sideways or up, so we avoid any circular things we might want to do. And the raw data gets, we compute the, tra the entities layer. From entities layer, we compute the data sets layer. And finally, we have the exports layer, which is just the logic abstracted away into what database technology we're using. I spoke to you a little bit about what raw data is, so that's you know, and song and any metadata entities. We um, decided to split our data into kind of four main uh, sets of data. So we have track data and track user data. And the interesting difference here is we want to be one of the primary Statistics that we're computing is unique number of listeners. In order to compute unique number of listeners over various time frames, we actually need to keep track of who the users are that listen to this track or to this artist. So for that, we need a track user entity. And the same thing for artist. And as you can see here too, we actually use, because we know which tracks the artist has, we're able to then, once we have computed the track user entity, we're able to compute the artist user entity from there, just using that knowledge. From artist user, we compute artist because that's a co essentially a collapsed version of that. And from track user, we compute track. From there, we go into data sets. And the data sets, we have two fundamental um, data sets that we compute. We have the track data set and the artist data set. And what those are is basically any information that we saw in the dashboard that I showed you, the SFI, essentially just um, in a single blob of data. Finally, the exports. Um, we have, the thing with the final storage is it might change. We, the requirements might change, the latency requirements might change, whatever. So we wanted to abstract that in a separate layer that's separate from any of the computation logic and the, lo the data structure logic. So that lives in a separate layer. A few important things about our pipeline architecture. Um, Spotify recently decided to partner with Google um, and use the Google suite of products, uh, the, um, the computing engine products. So we use the Google Cloud Store, which is essentially their cloud file storage. We use uh, Google Dataflow, which is their computation mechanism. And we use Data Store as our database technology um, to put our data into the back end. The framework that we use, we use uh, Scala and Shio, which is built on top of Google's Dataflow. And for schema, we use protobufs. What it, so I'll talk a little bit about Shio. Shio is actually a framework that was built in-house um, at Spotify. It's an open source product. It is built, it's a Scala set of libraries and tools that lets you uh, write Google Dataflow jobs, but in Scala. And for us, it's been very powerful um, for various reasons. Um, it it has seen, provides seamless integration with all of the Google suite of products like BigQuery, Bigtable, Data Store, and it has um, unified batch and streaming model, which is great. Um, and of course, 
with that, we get all the advantages of Scala as well. Uh, just a simple example to show you how simple things are to write in Shio. We have here a word canonical word count example. I'm sure you've all seen this. But essentially, this is all the logic that you need to write in order to do the word count in Shio. So one of the important components of this architecture was the choice of using protobufs. Protobufs um, is, you know, a, a, one of the ways to define schemas. You also can use Avro Parquet. We chose protobufs because they provide a lot of flexibility and very seamless schema evolution uh, system that allows you to define something very compactly and it compiles into Scala uh, so you can use it kind of inside your pipelines. The reason I think it's very important that we use something like uh, protobufs rather than just using, say, Scala case classes is because it allows us to define a very sophisticated, complicated, nested structure with repeated fields and tree structures, et cetera. And we can still just have this one single thing that we build in a single stage of the pipeline and kind of propagate it further. So yes, so this is kind of the more in-depth version of the architecture diagram. Uh, you can see here um, we have, so the input stream, we get this NSONG record. We take all of the other data sources that we have. So in this case, I highlighted metadata collection playlist. We join them all together. So what we get from that is we get a stream of all the information we need to compute. The entities pipeline, we want to run, what, what is, so entities pipeline is essentially, uh, you take all the information that you have and you aggregate it at just a raw level. So for instance, you know, if I wanted to figure out how many people in New York City, maybe I will go to every single borough and uh, within every single borough, maybe I'll count the number of people in every building, you know. So this is kind of a very abstracted, no business logic whatsoever, raw way to pre-aggregate the data so we just don't get this giant massive amount of data to deal with. From, and from that, you know, as I mentioned, we compute the four different types of entities. Here you, you can see the dependencies from, uh, from each other that they have. The artist user and track user entities is static entity. So it's, the idea is you only have to look at it at one single entity every single day when you compute the data sets because the idea is the data set layer, we want it to be very fast. So if we are able to compute the entities every single hour, by the virtue of having done this every hour, computing this bloated data set every hour, by the time that the day is done and we've computed 24 components of 24 of the sl slices, we get into data sets and the data sets we have very little data to process because all we have is this, the track user entity which is the biggest one, as you can imagine, this is historical. Every track cross every user, so it can, you know, multiple terabytes probably. Um, but we only have to process one of them. The yucky part here is if you have to join them, because if you have to join this massive data set um, with another one of those, it, it gets very slow. So when the entities are done, the data sets run once a day. The difference between track user entity and track entity is that the track entity is cumulative data, so that might be number of streams per the type of person listening. So we actually uh, have 24 different slices of those. We take all of those by artist or by track, and we compute the data set from there. So this just shows you kind of a uh, bird's eye view, if you will, on what this pipeline might look like, and this is the drawing provided by Google for us. So it still has many, as you can see, you know, there's many stages, so there might be like, so this is probably a join, I can't really read too well. But this is a join, there's another join, a map, aggregate by key, et cetera. So it's all the, the standard things that you might think of in a standard pipeline. So what does an entity look like? An entity has a key, which is a very denormalized view of this data. So in this case, you have an artist ID uh, uh, along with 
gender information, age, location, type of listener. Um, so type of listener being like new repeated fan, follower, et cetera. Uh, and play source being like um, collection, playlist, et cetera. Along with stats. And stats is any information that we want to keep like number of skips, number of saves, number of streams, um, number of starts, stream starts, et cetera. Whatever you can think of. The way to think about it is if you have all these end songs and you apply those different types of filters or aggregations on top of it, you know, if say you want to take a slice from it, and in this case male in this particular age range from Brazil and listener type fan, you would only get a subset of this. So each one of these keys is a summation of all of these, but each one of these keys is kind of in this denormalized table. The data set layer looks very, very different. The data set layer is our canonical hierarchical structure of what our data actually looks like. So this is kind of get, gets to the crux of what, why this unified architecture is good, because if we in a single pipeline can compute this whole structure, okay, so what we can then create the logic that will write it into a database, kind of the whole thing, or we can extract certain things to write in a certain other parts in the database, so the flexibility is built into this tree structure. And the way that it's structured is you have an artist or track at the top from there, you have your uh, geographical information. So we want to be able to aggregate either globally or by country or by city. Within each of those, you have all the different data sets that we show. And this is from what I showed you. It's essentially the type of graph or chart that we're building. So you have demographics, timeline, listener context, and uh, list of top cities. From there, you might have, so for instance, for demographics, you might have the reason there's two of them is because you have, like, one of them might be male, the other one might be female, and age. And within that, we bake in kind of the types of listeners here. So within each of these data sections, you will have all the different types of listeners that we care about. And within that, you have different types of data that you store in there, so number of listeners, streams, saves, skips, as well as the different time frames we want to compute it for. So one day, seven days, 28 days, and all time. And how does that actually work in our case? We can then use this to, um, you know, essentially traverse a tree and look at the leaf node to be able to compute one of these data um, graphs. So in this case, I want to know what my listeners are in Brazil, and I want to know the top cities in Brazil. And I care, I want to know new listeners in the last seven days. So you can see how in the tree that will show you that particular slice of information. Or demographic graphs. So in the demographics, you want to show all the demographics by gender. So you look at both demographic slices and kind of the same thing. So you go to repeat listeners in this case um, and over the past 28 days. So, um, you know, this gives you a lot of flexibility. So if we add a new statistic, we don't have to rewrite any of the pipelines. All we have to do is because we have the logic for computation of listeners by all the different time frames, essentially in a function, we can just add the logic. So say now we want to compute it by, you know, last six months. We just add the logic to our function to compute the last six months, and that's it. So the whole tree will then get that information kind of for free into it. Which is, which is, I, I think it's extremely powerful. So finally, we have this data stored. It's stored in a protobuf at this point. And we want to actually export into database. The data store is the solution that we use for that. Data store, the nice thing about data store is it provides a, it's, it's a key val, but it gives you a hierarchical, a little bit of a hierarchical structure. So you can do things like this. So in this case, we're using ancestral relationships in the data store to define the structure. So in this case, we have the artist, which, and the artist has a bunch of different tracks. Um, and within the artist, we store timeline information, keyed by year, and the, the blob of the rest of the data, just stored by date. And the same thing for track. And the things that you can do with structure like that, you can say, give me all the tracks for artist X. 
which will then give you all of this without you necessarily having to store it in a single structure. So in conclusion, you know, we think that um, unified pipeline architecture is extremely powerful because it allows you uh, to consolidate your logic and to paralyze your processing based on the denormalized data. So you minimize the number of joins, lar very large joins with uh, big data sets. And you can read the sources only once and decorate them for further processing. And essentially, it allows you to kind of think about the future and flexibility. <laughs>